Good morning. I wanted to welcome every, everyone to St. David's this morning um, on our nice, a nice morning. Uh, there are a number of announcements on the bulletin, but I'd like to bring a special one to your attention. There's a celebration of someone's birthday after, and everyone's welcome to join. So Sheena's celebrated her 80th birthday, and she's continuing to celebrate, which is wonderful. Good morning, and welcome to worship at St. David's this morning. I'd like to invite the aforementioned Sheena up to lead us in our Lenten liturgy, which you can find printed on the insert in your order of service. Welcome, Sheena. Do join me in the liturgy. The Lenten journey continues. Why is the road so dangerous? What will we do if we face choices of life or death? Dare we trust in the power of God to renew our lives? Are we prepared to share the vision of others? The quest tests and tries us. Perhaps we should turn back. We pray that Jesus will be our God. Let us pray. God of the dried out places, there is no place that is too dark for your presence. There are no situations that are beyond your grace. Even barren places of grief, poverty and hopelessness are in your hands. Bring life where there is death, healing where there is pain, and courage where there is fear. Stay with us as we make our way on the Christ path. Amen. Let's join together in our call to worship as printed in your order of service. More than those who watch for the morning do the faithful wait for God. We wait to feel God's light shine on us. We come to God as the source of our life. The Spirit breathes upon us. us 
Come, let us worship the Lord our God, and let's sing God's praise together with hymn number 209, O Love That Wilt Not Let Me Go, number 209. Please be seated. Let's come before God this morning with our prayers of adoration and confession as we acknowledge how great God is and how much we need his help. Let's pray together. Lord our God, You are the God of the past, the present, and the future. You are the one who makes all things new, and we praise you. In the face of all that grinds us down, all that saps the life from our bones, we hear your words echo through the centuries. You shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. When we hear these words, Lord, our doubt is challenged. Seeds of hope begin to grow. Pictures of peace become a little clearer. Images of the possible new life you offer fuels our passion. Your people breathe again. O Lord our God, your ways are wonderful to us. Your work is glorious. The path of renewal that you put before us is holy. But we confess, Lord God, that our memory is often short. In winter, it is hard for us to remember the warmth of summer. We often forget that before blossoms and greenery comes the mud and the rain of springtime. In short, Lord, we forget your power and your love. In the face of grim realities, when the struggle becomes hard, when the powers that oppose us are strong, we crumble. Apathy sets in, and only your voice, O Lord, can stir us. You shall live, and you shall know that I am the Lord. Lord, do not let us be defined by our failures, by our weaknesses or discouragements. Do not let us be defined by all that works against us, 
Lord, heal us, renew us, and restore us. Bless all of our attempts at faithful living and grant that imperfect as we are, we may live abundantly and know that you are the Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. My friends, hear the good news of the gospel. New life is God's response to human endings. We are forgiven in Christ. Life flourishes. Thanks be to God. Let's join together in celebration with that great prayer which Jesus taught his disciples, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And thank you to the choir for that uh, beautiful song. Let's come together uh, to sing our children's hymn, which is number 241. What are these wounds in your hands, dear Savior? 241.
my friends. What are these wounds in your brow, dear Savior? What are these wounds in your brow? These are the wounds with which I was wounded here in the house of my friends. What are these wounds in your side, dear Savior? What are these wounds in your side? Please be seated, and any children can come up to the front now. And before we come to God's word, let's say a prayer that the Spirit would be with us and in the words that we hear. Let's pray. Heavenly God, we ask that you would pour out your Spirit on the words that we're about to hear. We ask that your breath of life 
would come rushing into our hearts, that where we are dry, where we are lonely, you would be there. Open our hearts to hear your message for us, Lord. Let not our hearts be hardened. And may we joyfully respond to all that we learn today. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Today's scripture reading is from the book of Ezekiel, chapter 37, verses 1 through 14. That's found in page 1,295 in your pew Bibles. The hand of the Lord was on me, and he brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. He led me back and forth among them, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, Son of man, can these bones live? I said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then he said to me, Prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you, and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded, and uh, and as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, Prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to it, This is what the sovereign Lord says, Come, breath, from the four winds, and breathe into these slain, that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath entered them. They came to life and stood upon their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. They say, Our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, This is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I am going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you, and you will live, and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken, and I have done it, declares the Lord. Praise be to God's word. Our responsive psalm this morning is psalm number 130, which you can find on page 929 of your pew Bible. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. If you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, so that we can with reverence serve you. I wait for the Lord, my whole being waits, and in his word I put my hope. Israel, put your hope in the Lord, for with the Lord is unfailing love, and with him is full redemption. And our New Testament reading from the Gospel is John chapter 11, verses 17 to 45, found on page 1599. See if you can hear our memory verse. Thank you. 
chapter 11, 17 to 45. Jesus comforts the sisters of Lazarus. On his arrival, Jesus found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Mary and Martha to comfort them in the loss of their brother. When Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But I know that even now God will give you whatever you ask. Jesus said to her, Your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she told him. I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who has come into the world. After she had said this, she went back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and is asking for you. When Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. Now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. When the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet and said, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him? he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. Jesus wept. Then the Jews said, See how he loved him. But some of them said, Could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, the sister of the dead man, by this time there is a bad odor, for he has been there four days. Then Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believe you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. Then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I knew that you always hear me, but I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. When he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. The dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth around his face. Jesus said to them, Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Therefore, many of the Jews who had come to visit Mary and had seen what Jesus did put their faith in him. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's sing together hymn number 384, O Breath of Life, Come Sweeping Through Us, 384.
Let us pray. O Lord, our God, we pray that you would pour out your Spirit on me, that your words of hope and strength would come to your people through me, or if the need be, then in spite of me. May your breath of life blow into the lungs of your people this morning. May it fill us with your holy fire, that we might shake off the shrouds of death and take up the call to abundant life that you offer us this morning. Amen. One of the immensely valuable gifts that I received when I was growing up was the fact that my father made sure that I was always enrolled in swimming lessons. My sister and I both took them, summer and winter, and in the end we were both ultimately certified as lifeguards, having reached that final pinnacle of swimming education. One of the big advantages of that training was that I learned how to properly perform CPR, how to perform first aid on someone whose heart had stopped beating. And one of the big advantages of knowing how to properly perform CPR is the feeling of smug superiority that you get to enjoy every time you see a movie or a TV show where someone is supposedly performing CPR and say, that's not how it's done. Every time the hero, weeping, uses a closed fist to pound on the chest of the departed victim, saying something like, come on, breathe. But despite the improper form, cinematic CPR has a staggeringly high success rate. I actually came across an academic paper which was talking about this inflated CPR success rate on TV, even on some of the more realistic medical dramas. It said that it was at least twice the reality and that there were actually some problems with uh, medical care coming up because people expected more of CPR than the reality. Likewise, a flatlining heart monitor in the world of movies is unrealistically likely to just start beeping again. The stories of our time are chock full of these moments of bated breath as we sit and we watch the hero punch on the chest or watch as the camera zooms in on a flatlining EKG monitor and we think to ourselves along with everyone else in the theater or the living room, maybe just maybe. And then suddenly, against all the odds, life comes roaring back, and we all cheer at the good fortune. Our two stories from the scriptures today are very different than this, and they take the time to point it out. In the Gospel of John, Lazarus is not given CPR. And there's no echo of a heartbeat to break the silence of the valley of the dry bones. Both writers go out of their way to make a point. In these places, in these stories, there is no point in watching for signs of life. Lazarus has been dead for four days. And Jesus has to be warned of the smell from the body. Ezekiel, when he's taken to the valley of dry bones, is asked to inspect them. And he duly records that they were indeed dusty old bones, stripped even of their marrow, so that not even the sun or the wind could do any more damage to them. There is no spark to watch for. No camera zooming in, no breath being held that there might be life again. When God asks Ezekiel, can these bones live again? There really is an obvious answer. No. No, they cannot. 
No one would ever think to themselves as they stood in the valley of the dry bones, maybe, just maybe, life could come rushing back to these people. Ezekiel was a prophet during a very difficult time. The Babylonians had conquered Jerusalem, and he was one of the leaders of the community taken away from the city in the first wave of the exiles in 597 BC. They were taken from their lives, from their community, from their temple. And if there was any hope that those who were taken away would be able to return, that the life of the Jewish people could return to the way it had been, that hope was completely destroyed ten years later as Jerusalem experienced the destruction of their temple, the center of their religious and cultural life. The people had been scattered, and their home, the nexus that joined them together in spirit, had been destroyed each brick disjointed from the others, scattered about on the ground. The people were in exile, subjugated by a much stronger nation, and as they thought about the days when they were able to worship God in the temple, or when they turned to face their future and think about the days ahead of them, I'd imagine that very few of them would have thought, Maybe, just maybe. Hope would have seemed hopeless. But the breath of life, God's spirit, is not like CPR. It is not a measure to preserve the nearly dead. It isn't even like cinematic CPR, to bring the recently dead back from the brink. When Ezekiel prophesied to the abandoned and desiccated bones as God instructed, when he called on God's breath of life, something completely unhoped for happened. In a land where no one was watching, where there was no hope at all, new life came roaring in, a mighty rushing wind. This was a message of hope that Ezekiel wrote for his people. After their home was destroyed and their temple had been broken down piece by piece, Ezekiel's message to his readers who had been taken into exile was this. Even here, even here in God-forsaken Babylon, the breath of God can fill the lungs of our people once again. Even now, the breath of life can blow into us. And so these words of scripture are a message of hope for us today. It's a message echoed throughout the scriptures. God breathes life into hopeless and abandoned old bones. There are realities that face us in this world. Situations that we see like a valley of dust, parched, unchanging, and unchangeable. Perhaps it is a loss like the one faced by the Israelites, the death of a way that life used to be for us. Or maybe it is a dream that we won't even let ourselves dream because it is too unrealistic. Healing for someone suffering from an addiction, or an illness, or healing for someone with a spirit poisoned by bitterness. I am sure that many of us can relate to those feelings of hopelessness. We all have a skeleton or two in our closet for God to breathe into. For the hearers of Ezekiel's message, new life would have seemed just as impossible as it would have for those gathered at the tomb of Lazarus or for Jesus' own disciples as they watched his body lowered down from the cross and taken away to the tomb. 
In the end, though, we who are Christians, we who love Christ, will celebrate Easter, the day when Jesus of Nazareth, full of the breath of life, was not bound by death. We celebrate the return of Lazarus and the new flesh and vitality of the valley of the dry bones. And after Ezekiel's message of hope, in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah, we celebrate that the captors, the Babylonians, were defeated, and the people of Israel did return to Jerusalem despite their doubts, and they rebuilt the temple from its scattered and dusty remains. Brothers and sisters in Christ, take heart and pray to God with the certainty that the spirit of life can do things beyond our hopes. We are never too far gone to be changed. We are never so alone that God cannot raise us up a family. Never so consumed by addiction that God cannot break the chains that bind us. We are never so broken that we cannot be given a sense of fulfillment in our own usefulness in the mission of God. Brothers and sisters, ask God to fill you with his spirit, and there is no limit to what can be made whole. Listen for the breath of God. Don't hide from it. Seek it out and breathe it in. Have the faith to trust that God will bring new life to you. Our God is a God of life, and it is a life that cannot be kept out by any power of death. And so this week, may you feel the breath of God blowing through your life. May you begin to see it moving in the lives of those you love. I hope that as you do experience it, you will take notice and you will share your witness with others, that you will be an encouragement to those around you. And as you do, may the breath of life fill your lungs with strength, with peace, with joy, with content and thanksgiving, and with grace. May the seed of God's word take root in your heart today. Amen. Freely we have received grace upon grace from God. Let's take part in the mission of God by contributing our free will offerings.
Let's pray together. Heavenly God, we ask that you would pour out your spirit on these gifts of money and of food. We ask that you would breathe life into them just as you have breathed new life into us. We pray that those who receive them would receive them as a gift from you, that they would feel the great love that you have for them, that they would take heart, that they would feel courage. Be with us as well, Lord, and continue to inspire in us hearts of generosity. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Let's come before God with our joy and our concern, with our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession. God of all times and places, we thank you that there is no place that we can go where your spirit is not already there. We remember that long before us, you were with your people, men and women of the faith, some of whom we remember today. We know that long after us, you will be with your people, with our children, with our grandchildren, long after we are gone. Here and now, Lord, in the sad and in the joyous, in fear and in confidence, in hope and despair, you are present. Where you are in our life, we are blessed. Our love is given energy. Our courage can be discovered. So, Lord, as we pray for our world and for the people in it, rekindle our belief, not that you will do our bidding, but that you will purify our lives and shape us to do your will. Hear us as in honesty we bring before you the people that we love and care for, praying that you would bring fullness of life to those we love. We focus our prayer on the people in our communities and in our world that are struggling. We call to mind especially those who are lonely, who are worried or plagued with anxiety. We pray that you would bring peace of mind to all who live in despair. We pray for the places in our world where there is injustice and hatred. Bring your compassion and kindness to the places of brokenness. And we bring before you in silence the prayers that have been on our hearts this week, asking that you would breathe life into all the situations of our lives. We bring all these prayers to you, Lord, in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And our sending hymn this morning is number 698, Savior, Teach Me Day by Day, 698.
friends, go into the world in peace. You are free people. May the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit rest on you this day. In Jesus' name, amen.